Hi, I'm Sierra, the founder of Good Juju. Welcome to Mindful Business Podcast, weekly discussions about mindfulness, entrepreneurship, and Web3. This live Twitter space is about an hour long. It's recorded and uploaded to YouTube to be played back anytime. You can click the link in our bio to subscribe to our YouTube where you can find previous episodes. This is episode 35, so there are plenty of previous episodes. Uh, But this episode 35 is Accessible Yoga Poses for Beginners. I am honored to be joined by someone who knows a lot about yoga, my lovely co-host, Abby, the creator of Elevate. As usual, how you doing, Abby? I'm excited about this subject in particular. I know both of you, or both you and I rather, could talk probably endlessly and fill many episodes about different aspects of yoga. And accessible yoga is really near and dear to my heart. You asked how I am. I'm uh, today. I could use a little more accessible practice. To be honest, I'm so I'm not sure if it's because Mercury's in Gatorade or my allergies or existential dread. But today, I just really need this uplifting conversation. So I'm really excited to sit down with you. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm excited to sit down and talk about this as well. Um, I'm definitely a firm believer that yoga is for everybody. Um, no matter what state your body is in, there's a way to make it work for you. So this is going to be a good one. But before we get into the yoga chat, I do want to mention that, especially since this is going to be up on our YouTube channel, I want to mention that I've introduced Mid Journey Mondays on our YouTube channel as a live stream. Um, And every Monday at 12 o'clock Eastern, I'm spending an hour Literally just showing people how to use MidJourney, doing community prompting, so we all kind of collaborate on prompts. Um, And it's basically just to share knowledge in terms of how to use it if you're interested in generative art or text-to-image AI tools. Uh, So I just want to put that out there for anyone who is encountering this on our YouTube channel. Uh, You can check that out in the live stream section. Um, But... Back to the yoga chat. Yoga is for everybody. Um, When I talk to people about yoga who don't practice yoga, they often tell me they aren't flexible. (laughs) They don't have great balance. Um, But when I think about yoga, I usually, I mean, I always, of course, you think about balance and flexibility, but what comes to mind is strength and this, not just physical strength, but this mental strength. Um, so yeah, do you, is this something people often say to you as well, Abby? I'm not flexible. I can't do yoga. I think that is a very common and probably one of the most common misconceptions people have is that, you know, and, and honestly, there's a lot of marketing out there that kind of makes people feel like, oh, I need to have a certain body type or I need to already be flexible. Um, people say, I can't touch my toes. And then, you know, the real common response is, well, that's why we practice yoga, you know? Um, and certainly if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. And, and flexibility is not something we just naturally gain more of as we age, generally speaking, unless there's a condition going on in your body. Generally speaking, we get tighter and less flexible. And so that's why we want to practice yoga. And I love how you started with saying yoga is for everybody, because that's very true. Um, And, you know, for the many hundreds, perhaps thousands of yoga postures that there are out there, there is always a variation. And, you know, we want to really find ways to make yoga, your practice, meet the needs of your body in this moment. And really, depending on on your your thought process behind yoga or why you would approach it in the first place, you know, classical yoga, really, it's not about the postures as much as it is about calming the mind and, you know, and finding this liberation within. And so we just do the physical stuff so we can get comfortable in the body to sit still anyway, right? So, of course, there are a number of ways to do that. Yes, absolutely. I I love that you said that that I'm not flexible thing is definitely a misconception and you don't need to have any certain body type or already have any certain level of flexibility to practice yoga. 
Um, and we've, we've also too, like we've talked about yoga in past episodes. I think we talked about it in episode six. That was a beginner's guide to breath work, yoga and mindfulness. And then I believe we also covered it again. We talked about yoga teacher training in episode 24, um, and then we touched on it again in the the meditation episode in episode twenty five. So yoga is something that we've we've covered from a lot of angles, um, but we haven't completely explored this like accessibility component. And I'm excited about that. And let's first start by talking a bit about what we mean by accessible yoga. Um, and, you know, and I guess I'll start by saying what comes to mind to, for me is being aware of the skill level of everyone, um, that you're practicing with or, or leading in a practice and offering modifications or variations of poses that make them accessible and approachable, um, considering the people that you're practicing with. Um, and obviously I'm speaking from a teacher's perspective. Um, people are obviously when people are on their own mat, they're going to challenge themselves to whatever level they feel comfortable as an individual. Um, but oftentimes people will look to the teacher as a guide in terms of uh, what's a good starting point or how they can evolve into a certain pose. So Abby, I'd love for you to tell me, you know, how do you define accessible yoga and how can a beginner find a teacher who's experienced in teaching accessible yoga? Right. So I, I'm with you on the definition. Really, it's meeting the needs of your body wherever you are in this moment. And it is important to try to find a teacher who is skilled in meeting those needs, especially if you're a beginner, especially if maybe you're working with an injury in your body or a limitation of some type, um, whatever it is. Often we have, um, you know, we're not all built the same, right? When we think about a, a yoga class and someone's leading a yoga class, they're, they're going to lead you all through the same postures or similar postures. And it is really great, especially if you're new, especially again, if you have something in your body that needs a little extra attention, maybe you triangle is just not going to work for you today or this year or ever in the way that other people do it. And so it's really beneficial to find a teacher who's able to give you, as you said, variations or some tools. Um, once upon a time, you know, we, and people still do refer to these things as props and um, modifications. I think I've mentioned her probably in, in each of our yoga episodes previously, but Diane Bondi, that's two N's, D-I-A-N-N-E, Bondi. She's got some great free resources as well as a lot of um, great paid workshops and trainings out there, but a lot of emphasis on tools and variations and even making the language that we use a little bit more accessible um, so that it feels more welcoming. And that's something she really kind of helped turn a light on for me about accessible yoga is, is, is the way that we present it. How are we welcoming all bodies, all skill levels into our classrooms and into to our experiences in terms of how to find those instructors you're never going to be word of mouth, of course, right? It's great to to kind of follow the recommendations of people that, have, that, that you trust, that have been in the industry, but maybe you don't know. Maybe you're brand new to the yoga scene altogether. Um, there are, you know, Yoga Alliance is one of those things that people register uh, their trainings through. And so often you can kind of look for a directory on the Yoga Alliance website. Um, but look in your community and start just start just looking at the buzz, attend a few different classes. Um, and, and I would say not just one with an instructor either, give it a couple of times. Um, and before you kind of really decide, okay, this is really working for me. This is my rhythm. This is my jam. Because, you know, even if, even if all 10 instructors you've checked out trained at the same place, right? Everyone has their own approach and 
everyone has an off day. <laughs> so I think um, giving it a shot, shopping around a little bit, asking that word of mouth and not being afraid to communicate your needs with those instructors. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. You know, communicating your needs is one part, but then also, I guess, overcoming any internal resistance that you have to modifications or props like blocks or straps. Um, I, I, people often have resistance to props and they want to challenge themselves or they don't want to be perceived as weak. <laughs> um, and there, yeah, there is something, a releasing of the ego that needs to happen. And blocks are or something I've only recently started using really in my yoga teacher training. I had, and honestly, because I never really knew how to use them. <laughs> but then they taught us in teacher training and they've helped me improve my form immensely. So, yes, and I, I love blocks. I use them every time I take a class or teach a class. And I also love that you mentioned using welcoming language. Um, I love reminding people as a teacher, like, hey, you can bend your knees and downward dog. Like, you don't need to, like, or your heels, like, don't need to be on the mat and downward dog. It's okay if they're up. Like, it's more important to have, like, that straight back. Or, like, you can bring your knees down to the mat and plank. Like, you don't need to strain yourself if you're, like, getting winded in that plank. It's okay to bring your knees down. Um, or even something like, hey, you can stay down in low cobra um, instead of uh, fully extending into full cobra or up dog. Um, and I feel like some people really do need these reminders because sometimes it's easy, especially when you're in a group exercise setting, to get distracted by what other people are doing or um, almost unintentionally kind of take on a competitive tone in terms of feeling like you need to match the speed or you know, variations that, you know, the people surrounding you are doing. So I feel like there's a lot of um, strength and power that comes in recognizing. And I, I don't even want to call it your, your body's limitations because it's not limitations. It's just that your body is different and you know what's best for your body and what's comfortable and what feels good and what doesn't. And it's about just like being okay with that. Um, so yes, 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 yes. We are totally on the same page and I am loving this conversation. I agree that like there, there does tend to be this resistance that comes up. In fact, you know, I, I've taught for a long time and it used to be pre COVID days, especially um, hands-on adjustments in my yoga community were were really a, a, a mark of a good teacher. We, people in my yoga community tend to seek out instructors who are going to give them hands-on adjustments, at least people who practice really regularly, right? Um, Post-COVID, that's changed a bit. But I, I will say, as a yoga instructor, I've had people who they just won't, won't let you, you know, they'll let you come and put your hands on them, but they're not going to budge, right? They're not going to budge. They're not going to bend the knee. They're not going to take the, the thing. Or, as you said, might, not, might really be kind of resistant or flat out refuse, right? The, the suggestion of a block or a strap or a bolster or a blanket because they're afraid of like, I'm doing it wrong or it looks weak. And so it's, I always really love watching that journey change and shift for people and that acceptance come. It doesn't for everyone. Um, but when it does, it's this beautiful thing because the truth is you can advance your practice and go so much further when you do use tools in your practice. You know, we think of tools, um, maybe the, the blocks or the straps as being something that you need because you're limited in your range of motion. But honestly, you can play with those tools and, and variations to unlock different levels for you, your inversions and um, your back bends and um, your binding. And it can really help you advance your practice. And when we do surrender to this like possibility instead of resisting um, what we think we don't need. That alone is this 
is this way of deepening your level of practice? Because we're really working on awareness, right? Working on that self-awareness. And, and as we deepen these physical postures, we start to deepen our connection to our breath. And our breath is how we begin to deepen that connection to stillness and, and really unlocking those deep benefits of the practice. But it starts by being comfortable in your body. You know, the word asana, right, is, is, is seat. And we're trying to find comfort and contentment within each pose in the practice so that we can get, you know, really get and unlock the benefits. And if all we're thinking is, oh my gosh, my hamstrings are, you know, <laughs> panting because we're, we've pushed ourselves beyond our limit of, of comfort level in this pose, then we're really like missing the mark, you know? It's such a Western idea to like this no pain, no gain, this like achievement, got to push myself. Um, it's got to hurt a little bit. I need to suffer to get the thing. I think that's such a Western mindset. And, you know, yoga practices are based in the East and, and, and have a whole different kind of concept and mindset behind it. And I think it can take some time for those of us who, who are very Westernized in our way of thinking to kind of settle into recognize that shift and, 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 and start to understand that this is an unfolding and a process. And if I can help myself along the way, I'm going to stick with this longer. I'm going to get more benefit. I'm going to be able to go to that next level that I'm trying to achieve. Um, and maybe even along the way, realize that's not the goal at all, you know? Absolutely. I got my first personal blocks as a Christmas gift. <laughs> this most recent holiday season um, for my husband and with blocks for the first time, I've been able to start to get myself up into headstands. Um, I've been able to come into um, like assisted warrior three poses that are uh, supported, but better form. Um, or even just grabbing onto it, I think, as you mentioned, in like a triangle pose to bring the, the ground a bit closer um, so that you can like op really open up and not be like um, kind of sagging down and drooping down into that side. So, yeah, I, I feel like um, they're actually not a crutch in any way. Um, and they're not necessarily something that makes your practice easier. Um, but in a lot of ways, there's something that can help you, um, I guess, I don't want to say practice better because I guess it's subjective in terms of what you think is good. But for me, it's helped with my form and getting into the postures better. Like there are, there are certain poses where I'm like, yeah, this is not happening for me without blocks, but with blocks, I can manage it. Um, and maybe that'll be different in six months, but this is where I'm at right now. And I respect that. So yeah, I love, you know, we're talking a lot about these just accessibility. I do want to touch on like some specific poses, um, shameless plug on the good juju blog. I've, I've started to put up some articles specifically about yoga. So we do have a benefits of yoga article that like really dives into, all the physical and emotional and spiritual benefits of practicing yoga, which is something we've also talked about on plenty of other mindful business episodes. Um, but there's also an accessible yoga poses for beginners article that really starts to like, kind of like just list out poses that could, could be accessible for most people. I don't want to say they are for everyone because I don't know everyone's specific circumstance, um, but from a teacher's perspective, they're usually like a safe, uh, starting point. So one that the first one that always comes to mind to me is mountain pose and mountain pose. Um, when people first see mountain pose, they're like, okay, I'm just like, okay, I'm just standing here. And it's like, no, you're not just standing there. <laughs> this is like such a foundational pose and your posture and your balance has a lot to do with it. And you're not just standing there, you're standing there with your feet, hips width distance, with your weight kind of evenly distributed, your toes are pointed forward, your arms are down by your side, and your crown is pointed up toward the ceiling and you have a long spine and you're 
intentionally standing there. You're not just like hanging out. Um, and I think mountain pose is a great starting point because for most of us um, that don't have trouble standing, uh, we can we can do this one. Um, but even for most of us, it can be tough to engage our muscles um, and really stand in a way that is mountain pose. Um, what do you think, Abby? What do you think of mountain pose in terms of its accessibility and what are some like hallmark poses that kind of come to you when you're thinking about teaching a class for beginners or maybe for someone who's never practiced yoga before? I think that you're so smart to start with such a foundational pose because truly mountain pose is really what we're building upon. All of the standing postures really build from this place that we come back to center. And if mountain pose isn't accessible to you, then your sitting bones become your feet and you can do mountain pose from a chair. Um, I've spent a lot of time doing either corporate, it's been a lot of times corporate, but it, it can also be senior, but it can also be to those who are limited to their, to a wheelchair. But a lot of um, the things we do in standing can be made ex even more accessible um, by just shifting the variations to, or rather the orientation and shifting a few of the key points that we're, we're cueing, right? Um, so I love mountain pose. And often when I cue it in a class, I liked how you said it, but stand there like you mean it. You know, we're rooting down, but as you said, lifting up through the crown. And I love visualizations with people too. So I will actually ask people to imagine what their crown looks like and how you stand proudly when you're wearing that crown. Um, and I, so I think that's such a great um, um, opening posture, a really good accessible one. Um, another is really, again, a lot of the things I think about I bring back to the chair. It could be that maybe you can't get down on the ground um, to do uh, a forward fold, forward fold or maybe a cat cow. I think cat cow is really accessible to a lot of people, but not everyone can be on their hands and knees, right? So you can sh simply shift the orientation of your cat cow to being in a chair. You could do it standing also with your legs apart and kind of squatting down a bit, but a chair you can put your sitting bones on that chair, scooch forward and really get that flexion and extension of the spine that you would be doing in, um, in, in the variation on the floor. Um, that tends to be accessible for most people. Um, and again, we can make it accessible for almost anyone if we just simply change the orientation, but keep the, the basics of the, of the pose the same. And the basics are going to be you know, moving that spine and connecting that movement to your breath. Um, you know, any of these poses, when, when we're thinking about beginner or accessibility, it's really like, how can I touch on all the major joints of the body? That's how I tend to structure these things. You know, how can I make sure I'm getting some flexion and extension of the spine? How can I make sure I'm helping to open up that upper back and shoulders and definitely give some hips to uh, some love rather to the hips? Um, what else do you have on your list um, in terms of poses that you think are great for um, making it accessible to beginners? Yes, I was definitely going to say cat cow, um, which is really typical and kind of a warm up, especially as you're going to get into a vinyasa or a class where you're kind of flowing through a series of poses. Um it's kind of a gentle flow between, as you mentioned, um, kind of arching your back and then lifting your head and tail bone, bone toward the ceiling um, and exhaling and like rounding your spine and tucking your chin into your chest and repeating this just to kind of warm the spine up. Um, cat cow is a really nice just intro as you kind of get started, but also just starting point for beginners to feel confident knowing I can do this and I can do this the right way and I can feel good about it. Plank, um, as we mentioned, plank pose, uh, you don't have to have your knees up. Um, you can always lower those knees down if necessary, but it is important to keep your wrists under your shoulders and if you can um well yeah 
your core engaged regardless and your body in a straight line. And yeah, it's always okay to lower those knees um, and you can, you know, don't hold it longer than is comfortable. Um, Another more restorative pose that comes to mind that's usually relatively accessible for people. Um, And if not, as you know, there are modifications, but child's pose Um, I like to start and and sometimes finish depending, you know, some people really like to go into a fetal pose at the end and then come up to sit. Sometimes I like to finish in a child's pose. It's very restorative. Um, It helps relieve tension. And you start up on your hands and knees and tabletop with your wrists under your shoulders and your knees under your hips. And then you lower your hips back towards your heels and you stretch your arms out in front of you. And just bring your forehead to rest uh, and and your knees are kind of spread out the distance of your mat or even wider. So it's really, it opens the shoulders, it opens the hips. I like to start with it sometimes if we're going to do a warrior flow where you're, you're holding your arms out a lot or like uh, you're bending into your front knee a lot. Sometimes it's nice to start or finish. And then another one, one more that that comes to mind that I have to mention is dead bug. <laughs> dead bug comes to mind. And this is a pose where like your all your limbs are raised up and like held in the air, like your arms and legs. Um, and obviously like you're coordinating your breathing process and there's like stretching and balancing. Um, but I, I think it's fun. <laughs> so yeah, those are some that come to mind that, I, but I might be biased in terms of what I believe is challenging. Um, but when I think about a beginner's class or beginner's flow, um, from my experience, most people can get into some version of this. And with child's pose, if for some people it's uncomfortable to have their, their legs spread open so wide, so they'll bring their knees under them and that's okay too. And for some people, the shoulder extension is too much in child's pose And they'll come up kind of and rest on their forearms um, or their their uh, elbows. And like, that's fine, too. So I feel like um, they're like, as you mentioned, there's always variations and modifications. um, But what what are your thoughts on, on those poses? Having worked with a few different populations over the years, I know that plank can be a challenge for a few people and and similarly childs if there's any knee issues. And so I wanted to offer up some even more accessible variations of what you mentioned. Um, Diane Bondi has, I know I'm like a stand for Diane Bondi over here, but she's taught me a flow, taught a flow of a sun salutation against the wall so that you could be against the wall doing plank and never get down on the ground. And so for folks who really do have, maybe it's a wrist injury and they can't plank, um, even putting the knees on the ground, maybe for some people can't plank. So you could do, um, where you're standing almost like. So imagine you're getting frisked, but your your arms are straighter out against that wall, shoulders distance. And you can take a breath in, press into the wall. And as you exhale, bend the elbows, bringing your chest towards the wall. And you're kind of leaning. When you inhale next, you're lifting the heart into like a bit of a back bend. And when you exhale, you lengthen the arms, push into the wall, stick your booty way back behind you so that it's like a down dog. But again, you're fully supported. Your legs are strong in the ground. Your arms are pressing into the wall. And then when you inhale, you bring the head up again and you're in that standing plank position again. Exhale, lower towards the wall. Inhale like an up dog. And again, you can flow through this against the wall so that you're getting the shape and a lot of the benefit of the plank and benefit of the flow, but without the stress and pressure on wrist and shoulders, if there's any reason um, that plank is just out of you, out of your reach at this time. Uh, child's pose, few different things there. If uh, being on your knees is difficult, maybe you can do it, but you need a little extra support. There are a few things you can do with bolsters or rolling up a blanket or even rolling up a towel. Some folks really enjoy having that under the ankles in child's pose. Some folks might like it um, more so between like your sitting bones and your heels. 
if it's a small rolled up little washcloth or towel, you can sometimes put that um, bet- beneath the knees so there's less pressure on the knees. There are going to be some populations, some folks who none of that's going to work because they can't be on their knees on the ground like that. So you could be on your back, like knees to chest, where you're still getting that um, feeling of child's pose, that nice spinal uh, stretch, right? That spinal flexion, but no pressure on your knees. You can also kind of do the same thing, but from a chair. You're sitting in a chair and you come into a bit of a relaxed forward fold. So it's like that shape of child's pose, um, but without any stress or pressure on the knees. So yeah, it's just, you know, when I think again about accessibility, I tend to think about many different populations. And it's just because I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different populations um, that, you know, sometimes certain things just are not going to work for certain people. So it's always great to kind of have in your toolbox as a teacher um, or even just as a practitioner, <clears throat> it's neat to have a variety of, the, variety of options in your toolbox because you never know. Life's going to throw you a curveball. It may be that today and in two years, you know, you can plank like a mofo, but there might be a hiccup along the way. There might be an injury. There might be whatever it is. And there might be a season that comes up where it's like, oh, can't do that. Well, does it mean you're not going to do your yoga? No, it just means that you're going to find a different, more innovative, more interesting way to approach that yoga. Um, and so, uh, let's see, you talked about, um, uh, child's pose. You talked about plank. Um, and I, let's see, I can't remember if you mentioned anything else in that little sequence. Um, but I wanted to mention pigeon isn't necessarily the most accessible, but it sure is a deeply beneficial one. It can be tricky for knees. And so in, and when we think about pigeon, what I'm referring to most of the time, when you think about it, people come into it from downward facing dog, It's a bit of a crooked leg down on the ground and your opposite leg is extended behind you. It's this deep hip external rotation and it really stretches all those external rotators deep in our glutes and our hips, which means it unlocks our low back, which is beautiful. However, that's a big stretch and it's a lot on people's knees. So there are a couple variations um, similarly that I love. If you can be on the ground, then get on your back into a figure four where you have, you're crossing, say your right ankle onto your left knee. You've created a figure four shape with your legs and then you're gonna pull those legs in towards your chest. Same thing as pigeon, it's just a different orientation and no stress on your knees. Um, So that's one variation. Another for that pigeon pose um, or kapotasana if you prefer Sanskrit, um, is again in a chair. You can sit in a chair similarly, your back is nice and tall and straight. Your sitting bones are pressed down into the ground. You're lifting that royal crown that you're wearing throughout your yoga practice. Picture what it looks like because, you know, you don't want to let it, let your crown fall and it's heavy, but you're going to cross your ankle onto your knee as you're sitting in a chair. Picture how a dude sits, right? That's how we sit when we're thinking about pigeon in a chair. And you can sit really tall and then gently begin to lean forward and bring that stretch into the hip and glutes. Same pose, three different variations, um, simply by changing your orientation. And so, you know, it's nice, again, even if you're not a beginner, um, to have these different variations in your little back pocket. And if your yoga pants doesn't have pockets, then in your little yoga bag. (laughs) Nice to have a bag of tricks because Again, life happens and different things bubble up in the body. And uh, it's nice when different seasons arrive in our, in our bodies to have all these variations to come back to. What are your thoughts? You are such a wealth of knowledge. And I love that you mentioned figure four as an alternative for pigeon. Pigeon can be really intense um, and... Not everyone's hips uh, want to open like that. <laughs> so I love that you mentioned figure four. Even, yeah, chair. I I feel like we need to, like, I want to do, like, a whole wall or chair uh, learning session with you because that's very intriguing to me. Um, and I feel like that level of accessibility is a necessary starting point for a huge population 
Um, and it's, I, I feel, okay, so it's good to know about props and variations and modifications as a teacher, but it's also important as someone who just practices yoga because I've noticed that not all teachers will cue variations or modifications or props. So sometimes it's best for you to just know as an individual that they're available and that if the teacher doesn't cue something um, that you have it for you and you can do what you need to do. Um, so I do want to talk more about props because there are certain props that uh, are of course like really fancy and you don't see as often, but then they're like kind of traditional classic props that most yoga studios will offer. Um, and I think those few things are blocks, um, which are exactly what they sound like. <laughs> They're like these rectangular uh, foam objects that you can use to bring the ground closer to you. Um, so imagine yourself in triangle pose with like that arm reaching down toward the ground. Uh, you might not be able to reach the ground. And maybe this is a circumstance where you need blocks. Or as I mentioned previously in Warrior 3, where you're like balancing on one leg and you have the other leg uh, up and you're like leaning forward to be the shape of a T and try and get absolutely flat. Um, maybe you have those arms down on two blocks in front of you so you can get your spine uh, straight. So blocks are incredible. Straps are another one that you'll see at studios a lot. Again, they're exactly what they sound like. They're usually, I don't know if they're canvas or cloth, but they're some type of woven material and they can help you. They can help you in a lot of ways. They can help you reach your feet in like a seated forward fold or a bridge, or I've seen people use them to for back bends like i've seen people use straps in a dancer pose or a mermaid pose to like because they can't reach that foot so they kind of wrap the strap around the foot and then they pull on that so straps can be incredible um to help you reach a limb probably your foot um in a position that you might not otherwise be able to reach it and then as abby mentioned blankets and I often see, I don't know if there's like a proper name for them. I want to say like Mexican blankets. There's like, and I know that you know what I'm talking about. I think they are Mexican blankets. I think they're, they're like a very specific like type of material. And they're, the, they're like these thick, like woven blankets. And maybe they're not. And Abby will know. And when I pass the mic to her, she can let me know if they're Mexican blankets. But they're like, they have like these nice designs on them. And they're really thick. And um, there you, you can use them to cushion your knees or like to support your, your wrists and downward dogs. So many different ways you can put them under your knees or just everything. Um, so those are the few that come to mind to me that I always see. Um, but I'm curious, Abby, are there other props that you often see in a studio setting or other things that you specifically or particularly recommend to beginners and also are they Mexican blankets <laughs> that is what I've always known them to be if there's another name I would love to know but I've always known them to be Mexican blankets and yes that does tend to be the go-to in most every studio I've been to in the many years of of practicing um, because they have this this thickness and stability you it's nice to have a firm um, shelf you can make a bit of a shelf for shoulder stands in particular um, to place under people's upper backs so that so that the head can be off, but the, the shoulders are supported and the neck is supported. Um, and yeah, those are wonderful to have. I also love a bolster. Um, we always had bolsters in our studios. Hugger Mugger makes them, but there's um, some, some, it used to be Hugger Mugger was like the go-to, but those are like 90 bucks and, and they're amazing. And they'll last you forever, but there are some like 40 to $50 option ones out there now, but those are awesome for a variety of things like, um, kind of like blocks, but in different ways are really nice for like bridges and back bending. They're great for under your legs. They're lovely for more, uh, restorative practices or yin practices where you're holding something forever. Um, it's a great prop to use for, uh, um, pigeon if uh, you can get in pigeon in, in the classic way but still need extra support 
Um, you can use blocks, but the bolster is just gives you a few extra options because you can use it for your upper body, your lower body, and it um, doubles, triples. I'm, I'm not sure how many uses I've listed now, but it, it also is a great meditation uh, cushion. I'm sitting on one right now. Um, I, it's, it's got a nice firmness to it. Um, so I love that as a tool. Another tool that you won't necessarily see a lot of already stocked in studios, but that can be nice to have in your personal practice. Um, I don't have one, but because I, I, I tend to be a little bit innovative and use things that I have around the house, but people love a yoga wheel, but, um, you know, for backbending and for inversions, but, you know, you can, you can do some, some similar things with, uh, uh, with blocks and bolsters, but also with the arm of your couch, if I'm being honest, or the big, um, fitness balls, those can be really nice for backbending, um, practice and, and things of that nature. Um, I'm trying to think, and here's one other tool I'm going to, I'm going to throw out there that I often give my beginners and it's more of a self-care and to use near the end of your practice, but get you some tennis balls. Yes, they make myofascial release balls and those are lovely. Um, and they have some benefit to it, but the most inexpensive, lovely functional tool, um, my favorite tool that I have in my toolkit are, is a big old bag of tennis balls because when I'm near the end of my practice and I'm doing any floor work and I'm, maybe I'm in that figure four, I like to take a tennis ball and stick it in my glutes and then lower that figure four down and I'll get into a stretch and then I'll also add compression in my different trigger points in my body with the tennis ball and suddenly angels are singing and all the tensions being released from my body. And it's just a great way to keep, keep uh, your fascia more mobile and, and, and movable. And it's just a lovely addition to, to your practice. Um, so those are probably my favorite tools. I'm trying to run down my brain and see. I will say lately I've been adding some light hand weights. If you don't follow Beach Yoga Girl on Instagram, highly recommend. She's menopausal and so am I. And so some of the, and she's been practicing as long as I have. And so it's neat to see um, some of the tips that she has and some different variations that she's adding to her practice with the lens of how does this help my changing um, hormones and, and menopausal body. So um, uh, we could probably do a whole thing on that too, but I'll just give the resource, check out Beach Yoga Girl if you're kind of interested in, in adding some light hand weights into your um, yoga flows and such. Yeah, I love that you just added all these awesome things. Bolsters are incredible, especially for restorative classes, as you mentioned. It's like bolsters are like an interesting combination of like a bean bag and a pillow. Like they're always like this very particular kind of <laughs> feeling to them. Um, but they are so cozy and can help you just like really relax um, when it's time to relax. I've never had a wheel, but I've always wanted one. Um, I do have one of those exercise balls um, and I do kind of lounge and lay on it. Um, and now that I think about it, that's just as good. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Now I've, my FOMO has been alleviated. <laughs> Tennis balls. Um, there's a girl in my yoga teacher training who swore by tennis balls. Um, not only just for everything, for her feet, for her back, you mentioned using it on your glutes, tennis balls, um, they're pretty versatile despite like them not being for, um, like a fitness tool or, or whatever, like <laughs> they certainly have a lot of uses. Um, and as you said, they're affordable. You can get what a pack of like four or five for probably under $12. So yes. And then hand weights. Um, yeah. For anyone who's gone to a yoga studio that has like mixed classes that are kind of a combination of um, cardio and, and yoga, um, sometimes they'll incorporate um, some hand weights and, and that can be really challenging, <laughs> especially if it's also hot. <laughs> and speaking of hot, um, I know we're talking about props and, and, things that you can use to, for, for variations and modifications. And this isn't necessarily a prop, but 
I feel like it's really important to mention like bringing towels to a hot class is so essential. And as someone like taking hot classes all the time and like someone teaching classes, um, I've seen people like slipping all over. I've seen people like wiping the sweat out of their eyes, like not able to focus and concentrate. So um, if you're going to go to a hot class, like don't underestimate the heat and like bring something so you can put it on your mat so you don't slip and fall and bring something that you can wipe yourself down. <laughs> I feel like such a mom like saying this, but um you would be surprised like how underprepared people come to like these really intense classes. And yeah, I think sometimes there's just an assumption that like, Oh, it's a yoga class, like whatever, like it, it won't be that challenging. And it's just like people get in there and you're just like, Whoa, like, <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. What do you, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, Abby? <laughs> You are so right about that. People do underestimate sometimes if they're brand new. Hot yoga, you definitely want a, a mat towel and a hand towel, ideally. Um, there are a lot of great brands out there. I particularly love Manduka. And even those, you know, there's variations of those. It's nice to get the ones that have the little rubber stickies on the back so that you're not just fighting your, your mat towel the whole time on class. I will say, too, even that is like, there's, you know, everyone has their own method and technique. I always, um, I'm not really into hot yoga these days, but when I was, I would always kind of wait till I had worked up a good sweat and then I'd bring my towel out. Usually like when we get to seated postures or things like that. Um, but even, even there, there's some variations in your mat choices as well. There are some mats that are specific for hot yoga um, and there are mats that are nicer for maybe the styles that you're on your knees a little more. Um, I love my Manduka Pro mat for when I'm doing, you know, really my regular daily practice because it's very thick. It's kind of heavy, though, so it's not always the most, like, easy to transport to and from classes. Um, so if you have a studio where you can keep a mat there, it's nice for that. But the Life Form yoga mats, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but those are amazing for hot yoga. You really don't need a mat towel. You just need your hand towel. Although sometimes I would still use it with, with that, but often not because it, it absorbs the moisture. Those are going to break down on you though. The Manduka have a lifetime guarantee. They're going to last you forever. Um, you can't wear one out, but the life form, they do wear out over a period of, I don't know. I've had mine honestly a long time, but eventually they do start to break down on you. Um, and they're an investment, but it's like running shoes running shoes are going to break down on you too. And so you have to replace those, you know, every so often. So kind of the same thing. Um, so yeah, as we're talking that that's probably another thing to think about are, are, are yoga mats. You can certainly as a beginner start with any old mat, no problem, but those will also break down on you and they're usually super thin. Um, so, you know, there's a range of prices and styles out there. I tend to look at it as I'm, I'm a long time practitioner and I practice a lot. And so I've tended to invest a little bit in my yoga equipment, my accessories, my gear, and then it lasts me forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, so yeah. Uh, what do you, th what kind of mat do you think about and what do you like to practice on? I just looked up that mat that you mentioned, and I have definitely seen people in studios with this mat, and I recognize it, but I've never actually used one. Um, and it's super highly rated, um, lots of positive reviews. So thank you for this recommendation. I'm going to check it out. Um, I have a few different mats. I have like the cheapy ones. And by cheapy, I just mean like the kind that you can get at Marshall's for like $12. Um, I have like an aloe mat that eh, is really nice. Um, but I feel I do a lot of hot yoga and just isn't appropriate for all the sweat. Um, so I don't use it as often. I have a Lululemon mat that's really nice. Um, I don't know. I'm not like, I don't have a tried and true mat. I kind of rotate depending on the type of class I'm taking and honestly, depending on how sweaty and dirty and funky my other mats are. <laughs> when when the last time I sprayed uh, the other mats was, 
Um, but I'm always interested in hearing and seeing what people like. I've heard a lot of great things about Manduka mats. Um, and as you mentioned, these life form mats, I've definitely seen them, uh, people using them. And I like how, I like when mats have like lines on them that kind of help you orient where to put your feet. Um, I feel like that's like underrated and that people don't realize like how much of a hack that is. It's, it's just makes it so much easier to get into the appropriate form when you can quickly look down at your mat and just align yourself with the design on your mat or whatever it may be. So I think that's really cool. Um, something, what was the other thing I wanted to mention for accessibility? Um, oh no, I lost my train of thought. There was, uh, <laughs> I can't remember now. There was something else. We talked about props. We talked about modifications, variations. Oh, you kind of touched on this in terms of language, but like there are yoga studios where the entire yoga sequence is in Sanskrit. Um, and like, they don't use any, like the English words. And instead of saying clank, they'll say palakasara and they won't give any, um, cues. And by cues, I mean like verbal instruction in terms of what you should do with your body. They'll just like say the Sanskrit word. Um, so I think from an accessibility perspective, if you're a beginner and you're looking for a studio, um, those are questions to ask as you're like, you know, looking at the class schedule or considering like which class is best for you. Um, those are things to ask and just be like, hey, you know, <laughs> is the class in Sanskrit? Uh, are, are there cues? Is it appropriate for beginners? You know, what's the skill level? These are all things that you can ask. And sometimes, I, again, I feel like people have pride or there's this inherent assumption that it can't be that, that hard. Um, but I feel like the more, you know, the better. The more, you know, the better for sure. And look at the descriptions too. Um, I have found this in years past, as you said, folks either don't just either underestimate or I'm not sure, but often the description will say level two, very intense, whatever it might be. If you are a brand new beginner, maybe stick your, you know, big toe in the pond before jumping in the most intense class, unless you really love a challenge and that's fine. But generally, yeah, as you said, the more advanced the class is, you know, the less they're going to be giving a ton of verbal cues are going to just lead you through next pose, next pose, and you're just going to catch up. So I think that's a really good point is kind of notice what the skill level is before you go in and, and tune into that, you know, um, and kind of work your way up progressively so that you don't get overwhelmed. You don't injure yourself and you don't like turn yourself off from it right away. You know, it's meant to be, a practice. It's meant to be approached kind of patiently and persistently and to kind of build on your progress over a period of time. Um, you know, a lot of times we get overzealous, we jump in, we get all the gear, we go 42 times a week to the hardest things. And then suddenly we're like, Oh, fuck that. So, you know, pace yourself. Don't overwhelm yourself with getting too many tools because often the yoga studio is going to have what you need. Um, and then get innovative with your things at home. If you don't have the really cool yoga straps right away, get yourself, you know, a necktie or whatever it might be. I will say too, we talked about straps and we talked about they can make your arms longer. Some of the nicer straps that have the buckles on them can also be very useful for things like your inversions. You can, um, you know, use them to bind your elbows so that they don't flop lay apart, splay apart when you're lifting into, you know, feather of a peacock, pincha mayurasana, for example, or you can use them. I loved using a strap to keep my knees from falling wide open when I would lift into my danyurasana, into my wheel, because, um, uh, yeah, when we use our glutes, our hips want to open. And, and so, you know, having that extra um, binding tool can help you get deeper into certain postures um, when you really start to kind of uh, explore. So um, I love that you said it's not just to do this, that, or the other. Sometimes it really can help you deepen your practice, but just be patient with all of it. You know, it's meant to be 
it's meant to be a journey, a process. And, you know, you got to enjoy the journey one breath at a time and not, not get overwhelmed with any of it. Absolutely. It is important to create a safe environment for yourself and to know that you're going to grow and evolve in your yoga journey and that the most important part of yoga is listening to your own body and honoring your own unique experience. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of exploration that you'll do through your yoga journey, um, but it can benefit anyone regardless of their experience or physical ability. And I hope this conversation we've had over the last hour has really illustrated that. I'm sure um, I can speak for Abby and say, like, you're welcome to sign into either of our DMs to talk about accessible yoga. Um, or uh, we're both yoga teachers. And if you have questions about starting your own practice or where's a safe starting point, um, we'd be happy to help. Uh, we are approaching the last couple of minutes of this space. It has gone by really quickly. We've talked about a bunch of poses for beginners. We've talked about uh, modifications and variations and blocks and straps and um, even the process of, you know, finding a teacher who's experienced in teaching accessible yoga. So lots of good stuff. Um, I would like to welcome anyone now in these last few minutes. If you have anything you want to add to the conversation or if you have any questions, you're welcome to request the mic. Um, Otherwise, I will pass it back to Abby to share any closing thoughts as we kind of wrap up this yoga chat. I just, yeah, kind of want to bring it back to how you began the conversation that yoga really is for every body and all bodies are good bodies. And, um, you know, we want to, we want to change the practice to meet the needs of our bodies in this moment, rather than trying to make our bodies fit this thing, um, that, that we, you know, some other expectation, right. And that which we resist persists, right? So we want to make it easy on our bodies and we want to make it as accessible as possible so that there's compassion behind the practice. So that this is an act of self-love and compassion um, and something that's going to continue to make us feel good and put us in that state of flow. And if there are, you know, a number of tools out there that can help make that process just feel more complete, more, more, um, accessible, more, uh, whatever insert adjective here. Um, I just want to highly encourage you to continue to explore that. Um, because yeah, yoga is meant to kind of be with you for your lifetime. So start getting comfortable exploring. And as Sierra said, feel free to shoot us a DM. Um, we both love, love, love this whole subject and would love to help you on your journey. Beautiful. Well, that is episode 35 in the books. We have a fun schedule coming up for May. We're going to record episodes 36 through 39, um, which is incredible. Goodness gracious. We are really doing it. (laughs) We're going to talk about generative art at the beginning of the month and have a special guest who recently released the generative art collection. Uh, We're also going to talk about managing mental health next month because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, Any time is a good time to talk about mental health. Um, But May specifically is a fantastic time. There are tons of charities uh, raising money. Um, I see we have Jana here who's been doing uh, work with myself and a lot of other incredibly talented artists um, for the Jomo Effect Project to raise money for mental health awareness and support some awesome charities. So that will be a cool conversation. Um, We're going to revisit our Web3 onboarding series. We had an episode about how you can buy your first NFT, but now we're going to do an episode explaining how you can sell your first NFT, which for people naturally, I feel like it just becomes a progression after you collect for a while. And after you buy a lot of NFTs, at a certain point, you become inspired sometimes to create your own. Um, So we're going to talk about that. And then we're also going to talk about medicinal cannabis. Um, Cannabis is something Abby and I are both very passionate and experienced 
<laughs> with. So I'm excited to talk about how cannabis can be a tool for healing um, all different forms of cannabis, topical, edible, CBD, THC, minors, terps, all those things. So I'm looking forward to it. May is going to be stellar. Um, thanks everybody for hanging out with us this evening. It has been a lovely time. I hope everyone has an awesome week. We'll see you next time for episode 36. And yeah, sending lots of good juju out to all of our listeners. Uh, take care, y'all. See you soon. <laughs>